We are continuing today through Romans chapter 6. Uh, we are halfway through this chapter, and this chapter is essentially existing to do one thing. Uh, and so I've got to take you back to Romans 5, verse 18 to 21 to show you that. Romans 5, verse 18 says, Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Papa, verse 20 back up there, please. So this is the phrase. I pointed this out each week. This phrase right here, where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, is powerful, beautiful, glorious, and a little dangerous. This phrase is capable of being misinterpreted and misapplied to great harm. So Paul pretty much, as far as I can tell from my study, has written all of chapter 6 for no other reason than, you remember when you were a kid and you went to the bowling alley and they had those safety bumpers there so you literally couldn't get a gutter ball? Chapter 6 is the safety bumpers for 520. He is spending this entire chapter making sure you understand 520 exactly the one way he intends you to understand it varying neither to the right nor to the left, but exactly this one exact specific way. And so we, uh, we, we started dealing with that these last two Sundays, and uh, where we landed at the end of last week was Romans 6, verse 12 through 14, where it said, Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought excuse me, from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. And verse 14 is our launching point for our text today. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. So, our last two sermons were from the first half of chapter 6, where Paul was, was saying, I see how you might try to take what I said in 520, although those, verse, those chapters and verse numbers didn't exist back then, but work with me. I see, what you're, I see how someone could take that and try to say, Oh, you're giving us a license to sin. Sin increases, grace abounds all the more, so let's sin more. That's the idea, and Paul is very carefully saying, no, we will not continue in sin. What I said is not licensed to sin more so that grace may come more. But having spent the first half of the chapter doing that, he closes in verse 14 with, sin will have no, no dominion over you since you are not under law but under grace. And once again, here's an opportunity for the hostile reader or the sinful reader, at least, to say, ah, I got you again. You just said, I'm not under law, but under grace. Ah! So, if, if you were trying to argue against Paul, or if you were trying to loophole for your own reasons, for your own purposes, to excuse behaviors in yourself that you're not willing to release, this is, this is your chance. Because Paul has left you an opening, you think. Sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under grace. So Paul, again, is going to put up the other safety bumper on the other uh, gutter area of the bowling alley and say this in verse 15, which is our text for today, 15 to 19. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under, gra under law, but under grace? By no means. Meganoito, once again, no, heck no, 
absolutely not, may it never be, these are all appropriate ways to, to interpret that phrase. Are we to sin because we're not under the law but under grace? Is that the right application? Are you understanding correctly? Not under law. Oh, can I sin? No. Verse 16. Do you not know, meaning, of course, you're supposed to know, do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one to whom you obey? Or the one whom you obey, excuse me. Either of sin which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But, thanks be to God, that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And, having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. So, here in verse 15, he's essentially restating the same question that he did in verse 1, which is with a slightly different spin. Shall we sin more that grace may abound, was the question of chapter 6, verse 1. Now the question is, shall we sin since we're not under the law, but rather under grace? And again, the answer is no. And he will give two reasons why in the rest of this chapter. Today, we're going to briefly engage with the question once again, and we're going to give the first answer. We'll examine the first part of of his reason why. And when I come back to the pulpit in two weeks, we'll engage with the second reason why, which is in verses 20 through 23. So, let's turn our attention to verse 15. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law, but under grace? By no means. So this is a restated question from the beginning of the chapter. Do we have yet another reason to continue in sin? Answer, no. That's point one. Do we have yet another reason to continue in sin? Now again, remember, he's responding to what he's just said in verse 14. Sin shall have no dominion over you because you're not under law but under grace. And this is where I'm going to reopen the thought we closed on last week to make sure we understand that phrase correctly. If we read it very quickly and maybe a little lazily, we will hear that phrase, you're not under law but under grace, taking that as those are opposite ideas. You're either under law and you're under grace, and there's no crossover whatsoever between those two things. But the wrong conclusion would be to take you to, therefore, if I'm not under the law, I can do what I want to do. Reflecting back on what Paul has said since Romans 1, whatever not under the law means it definitely does not mean free from the moral authority of the law or free from the claims of the law on your life. This is God's law. He has put it on you. You are not free from its claims. So our our final point last week was that sin cannot dominate you because your relationship to the law has changed. And uh, I used a couple of source texts, which I'll start with today. Galatians 4, for example, verse 3. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved. So here's the slavery language, which we'll be engaging with multiple times today. Enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were, again, under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. So we were certainly under the law. Wow, 
Puberty came late. I'm 50. <laughs> certainly. We were certainly under the law before. Absolutely. In fact, he will go so far here as to say that Christ was born under the law. And that's a whole other, I, I can't do that today, but that's a whole thing right there. Continuing in Romans 7, which we'll get to soon in the near future. Paul's going to say, likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another. So die to the law so that you may belong to another. Remember that. That's going to be important as we go forward. To him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. So note that phrase right there. Our sinful passions aroused by the law. That was our previous relationship to God's law. When we were not in Christ, human beings in general don't like authority. We really don't like being told what to do or what not to do. And even if we weren't going to do something, the moment someone says don't do it, suddenly it is 50% more interesting to us than it was before. And we may well stick our hand directly in the bear trap for no other reason than somebody said don't. That is very literally human nature. Tell me what to do. This is, this is what we are. This is what we're like. Our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. Verse 6, but now we are released from the law. What does released mean? Again, don't take this to a place where Paul doesn't intend to take it. Released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve. Now notice that. Released from the law, not so we can just run wild and live in an anarchic lifestyle doing whatever we want to do, release from the law, the result being, so that we serve. Man, I was really hoping that being released from the law would mean released from the claims of the law, I can do what I want. And yet, here what Paul is saying is, I'm released from the law, and yet I find myself serving. So that we serve in the new way of the Spirit. Not in the old way of the written code. So, what I argued at the end of my message last week was that because you're under grace, you're in a different category and a different relationship to the law. Not that the law has nothing to do with you. No, you're still under its moral demands. You always will be in this world. But it might be easier, I suggested, if we considered the phrase to be something like you're not only under the law, you're also under grace. That would help you get in the lane that Paul's trying to steer you into a little bit. Because grace does something fantastic and amazing to our relationship to the law. It radically changes it, and it changes it in such a way, first of all, that grace gives us power to obey the law that we did not have before. As we pointed out several times in these last few weeks, the one thing the law definitely doesn't do is help you obey the law. It warns you, and that can be a motivator, but, but a warning is not a help. A warning is, if you do this, I will do this to you. But it doesn't help you. It just threatens you. It pronounces judgment and condemnation over you. But God's grace equips you toward holiness. The Holy Spirit takes up residence in you. And boy, that's an equipping. If a member of the Trinity has taken up occupancy inside of you, that's significant. Fair? <laughs> that is incredibly important and life-changing. Grace begins to equip you and to give you power to obey the law that the law never gave you. The law tells you what to do. Grace gives you the power to do it. And just as a quick note that I pointed out last week, and starts to stir your heart in such a way that you start to love God's law 
You value God's law. You appreciate God's law. Where before you saw control, err, and authority, err, and I can't do what I want, err. Instead, different words come to your mind. Words like safety, protection, comfort, guidance, good words, shepherding words. Words that keep you safe and alive and, dare I say, thriving. Somehow, God's law, which previously drove you crazy in your rebellious, sinful state, becomes life-giving. How I love to meditate on all your precepts, God. That kind of language from Psalm 119. Where, how could that happen? Because an incredible transformation happened to you when you came into Christ. So, that's the question. The question restated is, do we have yet another reason to continue in sin? Answer, no. And now, in point two, we're going to give the first reason why not. And when I come back next time, two weeks from now, I'll do point three, which is the second reason why not. So, here's the first reason that Paul says... We are not. We should not continue in sin. Number two, we are not free to choose sin. We're just not free to. If we're not under the law, may we choose sin? No. Let me give you a metaphor. I turned over several different metaphors in my head, and this is the one I landed on. Okay, now, I have various and sundry children, you all know them, that are various and sundry ages. Okay, I have a very broad sweep all the way from 23 to, uh, as of a couple days ago, 7 instead of 6. Happy birthday to you. (laughs) Um, Now, one of those children doesn't even live in my house anymore. So I don't, strangely, he doesn't call me and ask for permission to go to work. He doesn't call me and ask for permission to go to class. He, he's set up, he's an adult, he's doing his thing. Okay. Uh, the 20 year old also, pretty much, yeah, we have an arrangement where he pretty much comes and goes as he pleases. He's working, he's going to school, he's got his own car, he's doing his life, he's doing what kids that age who are still living at home are supposed to do. And that's all fine and dandy. Uh, if you've had kids that age in your house, you know how it is. You see them, ish. You know. <laughs> Just a little, you know, you're, you're helping them launch, you're providing them with a home while they get things sorted out to launch off into their own thing. And that's, that's fine. That's a good and right and appropriate transition. Gabriel comes and goes as he pleases. However, if Esther were to, uh, to walk past me in the kitchen, kind of give me a salute, reach down, put her shoes on, grab my car keys and say, okay, I'm off to Ellie's, see you later. <laughs> Now, that, that feeling that that generates in you, that's what I'm talking about when I say you are not free to choose sin. Okay? If, if, if my seven-year-old walks past me, grabs the car keys, and says, all right, see you all later, I'm out of here, I'm going to be like, no, you're not. <laughs> you are very much not out of here. In fact, you're more in here than you've been in a long time. That is not even an option on the table for you, seven-year-old child. That's just, that's not what we've, that's, that is not the arrangement. Absolutely not. Same thing here. Same idea here. You're just, you're not free to choose it. God did not rescue you from death and eternal destruction in hell at the highest possible price of the blood of Jesus Christ to leave you free to do whatever. That's not the arrangement. That's not the situation. So, first sub-point, letter A. In Christ, we have not become masterless. We have instead exchanged masters. Now, both of those ideas are really important. 
Because an unsaved person thinks they have no master. And they look at the, the person claiming to follow Christ and say, <laughs> Sucker, you've given your life away to some, for someone else to control. Not realizing how shaky the ground is on which they are standing in that moment. When you came to Christ, when Christ rescued you, when he redeemed you and you were brought from spiritual death to spiritual life, that was the leaving of a former master to come into the service of a new master. It is very much a setting free, and I'll, I'll get there, but not that kind of free. I will submit to you this day and every day for the rest of my career, no human is that kind of free. A completely free moral agent deciding completely unconstrained of their own accord what they're going to do, how they're going to live, the choices they're going to make. No human being has ever been free like that. That's, that's not what we're made for. Humans are never masterless. So look at verses 17 and 18 with me. Paul's going to say, Thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin... So, the former master was sin. You were slaves of sin. And have be, you have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. So, you're moving from one master to another. You're not moving from master to freedom. You're not moving from freedom to master. None of those things. You're moving from being mastered by one thing, from being enslaved to one thing, to being enslaved to a much different, much better, life-giving, eternally beautiful, glorious thing. Paul wants us to understand, in the words of our, of our Savior from Matthew 6, verse 24, no one can serve two masters. You can't. I feel like it's safe to separate that. Now, he's going to say, uh, you cannot serve God and money in this verse, but I feel like it's safe to separate this principle, and it still holds up. No one can serve two masters. You either hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You can't serve two masters. And it turns out, because of our human condition, you also can't serve zero masters. That's just, that's not on the menu. You will serve one. And Paul says in 17, you who were once slaves to sin, that necessitates you being set free from sin, which is what he says in verse 18. Having been set free from sin, you once were this, now you're this. This was a slavery, and it is almost impossible to convince most unbelievers of this fact. This is a very hard sell. And the reason I say so is because usually, if they do get sold on this idea, they are five minutes or less from receiving Christ as their Savior. Right? Okay. When your eyes actually open... And you look around and you go, wait a minute. What's been happening all this time? What have I been doing? Where have I been living? And what would have been the consequence of it? That kind of eye-opening reality usually leads to a decision for Christ very, very, very quickly. So it's, it's a hard sell for someone until the Spirit moves them and breaks their heart in such a way. But Paul will describe this very clearly many times in Scripture. I'll just borrow from our recent past in Romans 3, verse 9. He will say, What then, are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are, look at this phrase, under sin. Ah. Under sin. As it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands no one seeks for God. 
all have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. This is the beginning of a long description in Romans 3 of, a, of our slavery. You're enslaved, all right. How do I know? Because you, you couldn't get out if you wanted to. If you can't leave, you're a slave. If you, are, if you must obey, you're a slave. If, if this drags you down the road, you're a slave. Ironically, I think the people who may be closest, who are outside of Christ, understanding this reality, are really, really deep drug addicts. You see what I'm getting at? Whose eyes are at least partially open to, this is my life now. This is, I'm not doing these drugs anymore, they're doing me. I'm not taking them so much to get high as I am to stay well. Because they will punish me if I don't continue taking them. They will make me wretchedly sick. They will wreck and ruin me if I don't keep taking them. Uh, drug and alcohol addiction is shockingly an incredibly good picture of this sort of sin. That kind of an idea. When it just owns you. You can't walk away you can't escape from it. It will drag you down the road and make you do what it wants. You will do incredible things. Now, I, that wasn't my sin of choice in my pagan days, but I spent lots of time with guys who were drug addicts and alcohol addicts. And with those vices come other vices. Lying. Stealing. Embezzling. All these kind of things. Why? Why? Because you, you, you must pay your master. You must obey your master at any cost. Even if it gets you in jail, even if it makes you homeless, you must obey your master. You see it, friends? That's the slavery that we were in before Christ. And so Paul is going to argue instead that we have exchanged masters. This grace is a gift, but it is also a power. It empowers you. That, that grace has come to rescue you from the power of sin. And if you somehow are going to take the doctrine of this grace and try to find a way to use it as an excuse to dive into sin with impunity, then boy, are you the problem. Very much so. Paul will describe this sort of person in verse 17 who has gotten hold of this well. He will say... Um, you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart. Now, that's, that's important, first of all, just obedient from the heart. Let's be clear, that doesn't mean perfect obedience. Okay? It is completely reasonable, and I, I, I can see it. As soon as I say this, everybody's faces in the room are going to be on track with me. You can absolutely, positively love your wife with all your heart and still mess up powerfully in that relationship. Right? <laughs> okay. Ladies, is that the same for you? I don't know that much as well. I don't know that part as well. But I know from the man point of view how deeply and richly and profoundly I can love my wife and then totally torpedo it five minutes later because of just the nature of who I am. So when he says you become obedient from the heart, I don't take that to mean you become perfectly obedient Nothing else in Romans is going to suggest that. <laughs> Nothing. But rather, he's saying there's a desire, there's a commitment to obedience down deep. Even if you can't always get there. Okay? You may strike out, but you were swinging the bat hard. That kind of a thought. Does that make sense, church family? Obedient from the heart, he says. and to, Obedient to what? He says, to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. This is a very important idea. This is the kind of idea that gets me real excited and causes me to completely wreck the sermon I was writing and start writing a different sermon. Don't ask how I know. So, I, so heart, harnessing that, that power to distract myself and write other sermons that are not the sermon I'm supposed to be writing today, I'll just reach out into that other hypothetical sermon that I definitely did not write and borrow this thought from it. Obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching. 
Think about that for a moment. When we say, I want to be obedient, it's a very important question, to what? And to whom? I say this because there's a lot of nonsense out there flying under the flag of Christianity. So much so that I often feel compelled when I meet a stranger and they say, I love Jesus. And then my, usually my next question is, which Jesus? Okay. Tell me what you mean by that. Tell me about this Jesus whom you claim, whom you claim to love. Okay. You're trying to obey him. Okay. What is it that he's asking of you? I hate that we've got to ask these kind of questions. But there are so many false presentations of Christianity out there I'm not, I'm not talking about other religions that are just blatantly, obviously other religions. I'm not talking about Jewish people here. I'm not talking about Muslims. I'm talking about people who are trying to skate in under the banner of being Christ followers. But as soon as you start to ask, tell me about this Christ. And tell me what it means to follow him, that the reality comes forth. Are you all tracking with me on that? This is why we left our previous denominational commitment not too terribly long ago, right? Certainly claiming to be followers of Christ and using a lot of the same words we use, words like Baptist, words like infallibility, words like missions, words we use, but boy, the devil is quite literally in the details of those sorts of scenarios. Obedient to the standard of teaching. Here's what I'm getting at. There are some people who don't know the standard of teaching. How can they possibly be obedient? How? How How could they be? Either they are woefully ignorant, like many, to our great shame, like many, many professing Christians are who were raised in the church but never got past about a fourth grade Sunday school education level of being raised in the church, and they're walking around in spiritual diapers for the next 30 or 40 or 50 years, the kinds of immature Christians who are, again, literally know just enough to be dangerous. I I swear that's where that phrase comes from. I know it's not, but I swear it is. Knowing just enough to be dangerous is a, a, a phrase to describe immature believers, okay, who know how to operate the lighter but no idea how to properly use it and will burn the whole place down. Sometimes people are like that because of their own willful and woeful ignorance. Sometimes they're like that because they are not being taught better. Which is another sermon that I began writing (laughs) this past week, which was also not the point of this text. Because how will they know the standard? How will they know the standard of teaching if they're not being taught it? And boy, I could just stand here and monologue about that for hours. Naming names, citing accounts, pointing you toward YouTube videos of these famous, these famous Bible teachers who are teaching almost anything but Bible. How can they know? How can they be obedient if they don't know the standard of the teaching? To preserve myself from completely going off the deep end and preaching that sermon instead, I'm going to bring us back on point with 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. Peter warns, but false prophets also arose among the people. Talking about Israel's past, there were prophets and there were false prophets, always. And he says, just as there will be false teachers among you. There will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies. Remember, our definition of heresy was a a truth that belongs to Christianity, but horribly misapplied or blown way out of proportion in relationship to the rest of Christian truth. Secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And 
So that's one thing. These false teachers are bringing destruction on themselves. But that's not the worst of it. Verse 2, many will follow their sensuality. That's the danger of a false teacher. Is they have an audience. They have a group of influenceable people who have foolishly given them a platform and have given them their ear. Many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. I need a third, better, new private jet. Strictly hypothetical. No one would ever say that. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle. And their destruction is not asleep. Skipping ahead to verse 17 from 1 Peter 2. Still describing false teachers. These are waterless springs and mists driven by a storm. For them, the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. For speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. People who are sincerely trying to get away from worldliness. They entice those. Verse 19, and here's where we get back on point. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. And now we're back. Friends, for the past two generations, pretty much my entire lifetime, the American church, and really the Western church in general, has been shockingly permissive toward sexual sin. For the past two generations, I've been, I'm speaking mostly about heterosexual sexual sin that the church has been shockingly permissive of. Yeah, 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 that guy's got a girlfriend on the side, even though he's married, or yeah, yeah, he's, he's sleeping with his girlfriend, they're not married, or he's, he's living with his girlfriend, they're not married, but we just want him in church. And shockingly permissive of this. And now, in the past 15 years, the logical progression is obvious, the church has become shockingly permissive regarding homosexual sexual sin. Do I have to try to sell you on that idea, or do you just agree? It's so clear. It's so obvious. And many churches are getting sucked into it. And in the name of being accepting, okay, in the name of tolerance and accepting people, they end up preaching a repentanceless Christianity. And friends, that kind of gospel saves no one. A repentanceless Christianity is the worst thing you could try to sell somebody. That will save no one, and most dangerously of all, it will trick them into thinking they are saved. So they cruise straight into eternal destruction from the comfort of your church people. This is not loving. It has the illusion of being loving. It is accepting in a way that we will all enjoy fellowship in hell forever if we all accept each other like this. It is not helpful, and it sets no one free. It sticks a Christian bumper sticker on their chains. Friends, this must not be. It must not be. We are not free to choose sin. We have not become masterless. We have exchanged masters. He's going to go on to say in, in letter B in our notes that we are no longer to portray ourselves as if we are still under the old slavery, which brought only destruction. We're not to portray ourselves as if we're still under the old slavery. Because that brought destruction. So I'm looking at verses 16 and 19 here, and there are actually three sets of ideas I want to farm out of this. So, first of all, in verse 19, let's look at this. He's going to say, I'm speaking in human terms, 
because of your natural limitations. This is the easiest thing to understand. Basically, what he's saying is, I'm using this brutal imagery of master and slave, which is especially charged in our American cultural setting, to use those kind of words. Okay, please understand, Paul knows nothing about the American cultural setting as he's saying this, and if he did, I don't know that he would change his jargon. Slavery was common and happening in his lifetime. He's saying, I know I'm using a brutal analogy. I'm doing it because of your human weakness. Okay. Uh, sometimes you use carefully refined thoughts, otherwise you kick in the door. Other times you kick in the door. And he's saying, I'm using this brutal analogy on purpose to make it sink in, to shock your sensibilities a little bit, to penetrate your human weakness. So the next two things that I want to farm out of this, first of all, verse 16 and oh, actually in both, in both 16 and 19, is this idea of presenting. We talked about this last week as well. He says in 16, Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one, to whom, you obey, of the one whom you obey. If you present yourselves to them as slaves, you are. If you walk up and say, I'm your slave, the response will be, okay. Let's do slave stuff. That's, what, that's how that will go. You present yourselves for the opportunity for slavery. Don't be shocked when slavery happens. What, what was the scenario you were picturing? If you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, and then verse 19, just as you once presented your members, meaning the parts of your body, or really the parts of yourself, as slaves to impurity and lawlessness. So you did do this. You presented yourself. You endorsed the slavery. You leaned into it. He's going to go on to say, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness. So here's this idea of presenting yourself. Paul, Paul, one of Paul's big arguments last week was, man, the power of sin has been broken. Why are you still presenting yourself to it? You know, It is laying, bleeding out on the floor. Stop picking it up. Propping it up, propping it up so it can stand, and handing it your car keys. Stop doing that. To whom will you give those car keys? It doesn't own you, but if you keep handing it your keys, don't be surprised when you get driven places you weren't planning on going. What? How else was that going to play out? You don't have to do it anymore. If Christ is in you and you are in Christ if you've been rescued from, from sin, if Christ's death on the cross delivered you, sin is not the boss of you anymore. Why still live like slaves to it? Why would you do that? Why would you present yourself that way? So that's the second idea from this, is the idea of presenting yourself. The third idea is this, where this leads. And this is giving a sprinkling of, of the text from next week, too. So I'm only going to partially do this today. Verse 16. You are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death. If you're a slave to sin, sin leads to death. Same thing in verse 19. Just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness leading to more lawlessness. So, we were slaves to impurity. We were slaves to sin. We were slaves to lawlessness. And the fruit of that lawlessness is, unsurprisingly, further increasing lawlessness. You know what sin's favorite feature is? The repeat button. <laughs> Rewind, play. Rewind, play. How do I know that? Because for the umpteenth time, you and I know perfectly well, you're not doing every sin in the book. you got your favorite ten or so. There are all kinds of sins. Don't interest you at all. You never touch them. That You will never be brought down by, by some of those things. It's just, it's just No. Just no. No, but there's just a few that, boy, we sure seem to like. As we revisit them time and time again. We spend so much time with them 
cohabitating with them, that from a legal point of view, we're probably common law married. Again, not every sin in the book. No, just a few. But boy, we really like them. We really like them. We revisit them constantly. The fruit of sin and lawlessness is more lawlessness. And the eventual conclusion of that is death. That's how that ends. That's how that plays out. That is the track that you were on, and but for the supernatural rescue of Christ, that's where you would still be. It is literally miraculous that that's not still you, right? Because the old you sure couldn't stop. Lawlessness leading to more lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, and had you allowed the process to go on long enough, death would have been the end of that. How did you ever escape? You were rescued. You didn't wise up. Question if any of us have wised up today. (laughs) You didn't wise up. You weren't suddenly more spiritually astute and more morally clever than the other people you were rolling in the slop with. That's not what happened. Jesus Christ shattered your prison door and came in and grabbed you and snatched you out. Amen? If you're out, that's how. Not because you smartened up. And Paul is warning us here that if we are seeking ways to sin... So one sort of person is the person who's just attacking Paul, saying, oh, you're giving us excuse to sin. But there's another sort of a person who says, oh, is he giving me an excuse to sin? Do you see the difference I'm aiming at there? If that's you, if you're seeking ways to sin and get away with it, or seeking ways to sin and excuse it, that creates questions about your spiritual state. It should rightly lead you to a place of lacking assurance in Christ. That I'm not saying, oh, you're attacking my assurance. No, I'm telling you that is the attack on your assurance. I'm pointing it out. You shouldn't feel assurance when you're considering questions like that. How could I find a way to loophole this and get away with this sin? Boy, is that the wrong question. The Apostle John warns in 1 John 2, Verse 3, and by this we know that we've come to look to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commands is a liar. Harsh. But 2,000 years old, harsh. I didn't make it up. Whoever does not keep his commands is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him Truly, the love of God is perfected. By this, we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. If you're peeking around looking for ways to escape from this walk, you should be afraid. You should be concerned. Last thing, let's see. Paul has, going, Paul has told us we are no longer to portray ourselves as if we are still under the old slavery, which brought only destruction. Now we are to pursue obedience, let us see, to our new master, sanctifying righteousness. I chose very long words there. I'll give you a second. Sanctifying righteousness. Yep. Again, in verse 16. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one to whom you or the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. You're either a slave to sin or you're a slave to obedience. Verse 19. Just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now Present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. So, lawlessness led to more lawlessness, which would have led to death. The formula here in this part of the equation is obedience 
leads to righteousness, which leads to increasing sanctification. That's a better deal. By a long shot. It ain't going to kill you. In fact, the parts of you that this process will kill need killing. If obedience is painful, ask yourself why. <laughs> what, what nerves in you are crying out in pain, and how can you more thoroughly punish them <laughs> and beat them into submission? Obedience, righteousness, sanctification, these are life-giving words. These are eternally valuable words. It's these things that land you in safety and in security, resting in this life in the assurance of Christ and eventually just flat out resting in Christ. Amen. Let's look at Paul's words from two places, commenting on this idea. Ephesians 2, verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand, pre-scheduled works for you to do, that we should walk in them. You weren't saved to continue in slavery to the old master. The new master has a list for you. He has projects for you. He has works of sanctification and growth for you. Your new master who loves you and thinks you are so valuable to himself that he spent the most precious commodity there is to bring you to himself. He loves you that much. He is working for nothing but your own good. But what, but we're tempted to go, oh, that's slavery. That felt good. That old slavery, that was awesome. Literally running from the Savior in those moments. Looking Moses right in the eye and saying, we want to go back to Egypt. Wasn't in my support text. Clearly should have been. Titus 2. Look how Paul describes us here. And what we are and what we're supposed to be. This, this, this has haunted me since I came across this this week. Who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness. Remember, lawlessness led to more lawlessness, which led to death. To redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people, for his own possession. Listen to this heartbreaking description. Who are zealous for good works. That's not people who say, oh, i got to do the right thing. That's not zealous for good works. Zealous for good works is, we're doing the right thing, and it's awesome. Let's go. Let's go find the next right thing, and do it. Charging forward. From right thing to right thing. Zealous for good works. Man, I wish that described me. And I'm embarrassed that I know better. I wish that described our church. I wish that described the church. This is clearly what we're supposed to be. A people for God's own possession who are zealous for good works. God deliver us and get us there. Let's skip the Romans 6 thing. That was just stealing from next week anyway. Go on to the conclusion. Martin Lloyd-Jones, the, the great British pastor, uh, arguably, uh, no, not arguably, I say greatest preacher of the last century, Martin Lloyd-Jones. As you go on living this righteous life and practicing it with all your might and energy and all your time, you will find that the process that went that went on before, in which you went on from bad to worse and became viler and viler, is entirely reversed. You will become cleaner and cleaner and purer and purer and holier and holier and more and more conformed unto the image of the Son of God. 
That's Martin Lloyd-Jones preaching on this text. Church, let that be so. Let us so strive and so pray that it will be so. Father, we pray for grace and help, knowing just how very much we lack, how short we are in our ability to do these good things that you have already arranged for us to do and have rescued us for the purpose of doing. God, please, in your mercy and in your grace, break our hearts over our sin and stir such an affection for you and for your law in us that we do indeed become zealous for good works. In Christ our Savior's name we pray.